Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement. Welcome to JCO's Cancer Stories, The Art of Oncology, brought to you by the ASCO Podcast Network, a collection of nine programs covering a range of educational and scientific content and offering enriching insight into the role of cancer care. You can find all of the shows, including this one, at podcast.asco.org. Today, my guest in this podcast is Dr. Ann Moore. Dr. Moore's been instrumental in the field of breast cancer, especially related to her clinical and educational contributions to our field. Dr. Moore was raised uh, and spent much of her formative years in Peru. She received her undergraduate degree at Smith and her medical degree at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She completed a residency in internal medicine as well as her hematology and medical oncology fellowship at Cornell, where I believe she's basically spent the rest of her professional life, uh, now as a professor of clinical medicine and a director of the Iris Cantor Wheel Cornell Breast Cancer Survivorship Program at the Wheel Cornell Medical College of Cornell University. Dr. Moore, welcome to our program. Thank you, Dan. I hope I got all that right. I think I did. (laughs) Very happy to have you. And I consider you a real pioneer in that regard, Uh, being a woman physician in the the decades when that wasn't very common and a woman oncologist when it was almost unheard of, frankly. So I know you've probably got some great stories about your med school class where I think you were one of... 10 women in your class or something like that, and in your training. Can you fill us in on what it took for you to become a physician? Well, I must say I I went to all women's college. I went to Smith College. Um, So coming into a class with 10% of the class for women was a a big change uh, for me, but a very exciting one. Uh, The uh, women, uh, we respected each other. We were respected by our male colleagues. We, we were well treated. We were included uh, at Columbia. The faculty were always uh, gracious. We didn't have a sense of being excluded. Uh, um, so it was very, it was a, it was a fabulous place uh, to be and very exciting. Did you feel encouraged to pursue your ambitions or were there efforts to pigeonhole you into places you that you know were better for women but you might not have wanted to? For example, I interviewed I did interview Clara Bloomfield before she passed away. And uh, she made it clear that the things she wanted to do weren't considered ladylike uh, where <laughs> where she trained, but she did it anyway. Uh, did you run into that? No, we didn't. Uh, I remember the head of orthopedics speaking to me about an orthopedic fellowship. Some of my classmates did become pediatricians, which, of course, was a, a, a typical field and for women. But I was interested in hematology, oncology, even in, in medical school. And there was never a sense that that was not an appropriate place uh, for me. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I also know uh, in a chat you and I had before this that you were telling me, by the way, I Googled you and I found your original New York Times wedding announcement. Now, I, won't, I won't betray the date, but you had a very nice picture. You looked very young. You told me an interesting story about how much time you got off your honeymoon. That's right. 
we got married over a Labor Day weekend so we could get an extra day. And I had to go to my chief resident, whom I called uh, Dr. Dr. Steinberg, and request a not just a two-day weekend, but a three-day weekend. There was a lot of thought, but my fellow interns jumped in and covered for me <laughs> for that great event. Those were different times, that's for sure. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your career. Uh, I know in the early 1990s, you began a multidisciplinary breast clinic at Cornell, which at the time, even in the country, was pretty unusual. I'm going to throw out my mentor, Craig Henderson, had started one in the early 1980s uh, in Boston. But it, now it seems like everybody has a multidisciplinary clinic for every disease in oncology. What made you think that was a good idea then? Well, it was a very practical idea. When we saw a patient for a new diagnosis of cancer, and at that time I was already becoming very interested in breast cancer, the patient would come with her slides, with her mammograms, and I would run to surgical pathology, look at the slides, run over to the radiologist, interrupt them to look at the mammograms, run back downstairs to see the patient. And each specialist that I saw was teaching me so much while I was there, just looking over the microscope or looking at the screens. There's too much running around, number one. We all need to learn from each other, and it would certainly benefit the patients. And the, ben the decisions were becoming, at that time, a little more complex. We were beginning to think about adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant radiation therapy uh, for, the, for the new class of patients that had breast conservation. So it was clear that we had to get together. We realized that we had to we had to speak to each other, and it would be much easier if we were all in one room. So we started in 1991, picking out illustrative cases, and we didn't discuss every case by any means. And we would talk to the radiation therapist, the pathologist, the radiologist ahead of time. They would prepare their sections, and we would all meet. The joy that we had of doing this and the excitement in those first few meetings it's the first time we had ever had a meeting like that. And everybody was very excited to be there. And we met solidly up until up until today with those multidisciplinary meetings. They have become much more common. And now the group tries to present every case in some form of a multidisciplinary format. But those early tumor boards were, were enormously important and exciting for us. And who who were we back in yeah, it was it was basically the surgeons, of course, played a big role. The medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the pathologists, the radiologists, and they were sort of the center of the group. We brought the nurses. We brought. We didn't have genetic counselors involved at that time. We certainly do now. If we had special issues, we would bring in a specialist to help us, a gynecologist, for instance, or a gynecologic oncologist, if we had a case about uh, that involved uh, removal of the ovaries or risk of uterine cancer to talk to us. We had the, the obstetricians come with our first case of giving chemotherapy during pregnancy back in 1991, 27-year-old woman with an inflammatory breast cancer. To whom we wanted, we needed to give chemotherapy in the six month pregnancy. We had never done it before, and we we had a, a conference including the obstetricians again all together in one room. And then I had the practice of scheduling a telephone call with the patient who was presented, because very often they were my my patients. I was the person doing the most in breast cancer. We would have a scheduled telephone call. The night of the conference, after the conference, and I would review who was at the conference and tell them what the recommendations were. And sometimes we had two recommendations, one from one group and one from the other, and I explained that to the patient. And of course, they were, they were thrilled at the idea of all those people sitting there thinking about them. <laughs> <laughs> was, your, was the surgeon Mike Osborne? Michael Osborne was a, was later the chief of breast surgery. The original surgeons were our, really our private practitioners because at that time, most of the uh, surgery was done by private practitioners and most of the medical oncology 
primitive though it was, it was also done by private practitioners. I was one of the first to be a full-time employee of the hospital doing medical oncology. Wow. In Boston, it was interesting. There was a, I won't call it political split, but there was reluctance among some of the surgeons to engage in such a, an activity because they felt it would take away their autonomy and they didn't need it. And others who wouldn't miss a week, who, yeah. who loved it. Uh, ultimately, everybody joined. But uh, did you run into that as well, people who just didn't want to do this? No, I must say our surgeons were eager because this was the time when the, the, the question about breast conservation was coming up from the patients. Yeah. And these are surgeons who all had trained in the radical mastectomy. And, you know, New York City women weren't keeping their, weren't quiet. Yeah. <laughs> they were really in there saying, what do you think about breast conservation? And I must say that the surgeons at, at our hospital uh, wasn't true probably at every hospital, were willing to listen, but they hadn't had the experience in breast conservation. And that's one reason why they were happy to have the multidisciplinary group discuss that. So you must have been at the same time or just before that this was started at Memorial as well. And I know that then there became, a, was there a citywide breast cancer group that met? There was, a, there, a Memorial was, followed, was later with the multidisciplinary uh, tumor board uh, at their hospital, as was as were the other hospitals in New York. However, we did meet together, uh, starting in the ni- around 1971, with the New York Metropolitan Breast Cancer Group, which was a multidisciplinary group of the surgeons, oncologists, pathologists, the same uh, uh, group on, that we were meeting with on a smaller scale. And these, this was an enormous benefit to the doctors t- treating breast cancer in New York, that we were able to not only hear our own group, but we could hear the uh, the doctors from Memorial, from Mount Sinai, from Columbia, from Albert Einstein, from uh, Montefiore come and, and we would meet together. We'd have always have a social hour. They like their scotch, these surgeons. They like scotch. So we would <laughs> buy the scotch. <laughs> and uh, that must have been a real cast of characters. Uh, it, was it like, like Jerry Urban in those days? And it was just after Jerry Urban. It was just after Jerry Urban. After him. Wow. And how about Ezra Greenspan? Would he come to that? Ezra had his own ideas. Yeah. And not so interested in in this group, but uh, it was he was just a little bit too early. And could you get Jim Holland to come to that? Uh, the answer is Jim Holland was also not someone who felt he needed to hear a lot of opinions yes. <laughs> about management of cases. And um, but he on an individual basis, Jim Holland was very helpful with people. I would have I would have loved to have been at those meetings. That sounds like a oh, lot of fun. Great. And they, we, we still have them to this day. We meet four times a year with an annual meeting. Uh, on on one Saturday every year. And I know now that that the the last decade or so, you've really focused on survivorship as well as your breast cancer work. I talked to Patty Gans as a part of this series. And uh, in my opinion, she really began the field of survivorship. She started thinking about it 25 years ago. But you've really been a mover and shaker in that, especially, I think, in the New York City area. Uh, can you tell us about the clinic you've started and how that works? Well, the survivorship has always been interesting to me, partly because I started so early giving chemotherapy, for instance, and the patients, many of them had early stage two or stage one breast cancer, and they, 10 years has gone by, 20 years, 30 years, some cases 35 years, and they still come to see us once once a year. And I, I became more and more interested in what was going on with them, as well as obviously with the new patients and the new treatments. So it's always been an interest on an informal basis. I have followed Patty Gans wherever she goes. <laughs> I'm always asking her advice. I go to any lecture that's in the in anywhere near me. And I'm pretty sure she stays as late as she needs to and gives it to you willingly. I've never seen anybody as gracious as she is. With Absolutely. Her Absolutely. Let me ask you, this is uh, an opinion question on my part. 
there are three models. One is that we just keep our patients as long as we're alive and they're alive. The second is that we start separate survivorship clinics, probably run by not by us. Uh, and the third is we say, you've had enough of oncology, go back to your primary care. And we train the primary care doctors to be the survivorship. Which do you think, which of those do you prefer? Oh, I think about it a lot. Our primary care providers or gynecologists to whom we could refer patients after even, our, especially our very early stage patients, after let's say five years for their follow-up, I think they're very happy to have an oncologist on board. They have questions themselves. They don't have the confidence that they're giving the best follow-up, whereas, of course, they are, but, uh, but they're anxious that they don't know how to do it. So I think if we're going to hand them over, that is the patients, we really have to prepare the gynecologists and primary care providers with what we think is the most helpful way to follow these patients. And I don't, at least in New York, we have not been good about that part. I know other programs are trying hard uh, to, to educate their primary care providers to take these patients back in. I think it depends a lot on, on who's, who's available. In New York, we have a lot of oncologists. Some of the oncologists will, will continue to follow their patients for the rest of their lives. Many of our oncologists are finding that they just don't have enough chairs in their waiting rooms to continue to follow those the patients and and they need they want to hand them over the patients themselves would like to stay with a breast cancer specialist or a special clinic for breast cancer survivors and that's the model we've used and some institutions have made it a nurse practitioner um, program which I, I think again in the right situation is is certainly suitable yeah that's what we've done sort of a hybrid it depends on the patient. It depends on the patient. By the way, I found this is a wonderful problem to have. I was talking to a patient a few years ago, and I was saying, "I'm. You can just go back with your primary care doctor. You don't need to see me anymore." You, you know. And she said, "Well, I want to stay with you." And I said, "Well, the problem is there are too many of you for me to take care of." As soon as I said that, I thought. No, 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 that's not a problem. The good news is there are too many of you for me to take care of. So uh, we've all come up with it. All right, uh, to move on a little bit, you've already kind of alluded to this, but why oncology and why and when breast cancer? I will tell you that I read your CV and I saw your first paper was titled The Development of Neural Control of Elementary Motor Function in Vertebrates in a, in a surgical journal, a far cry from breast cancer. And I know some of your early work as a fellow was in hematology and platelet function. So when did you change gears? Well, I did my, my fellowship in 1973, 1974, finishing in 75. And really the uh, work in solid tumor for oncology wouldn't have filled up a half day in the clinic. We had 5-FU for colon cancer. We didn't treat lung cancer with chemotherapy. Those were two of our top cancers. And breast cancer pretty much was treated by the surgeons. The surgeons had a surgical oncology clinic where they give their 5-FU to the breast cancer patients. So they're really, or they did, of course, the ophorectomy followed by adrenalectomy, followed by hypophysectomy for the estrogen receptor positive for their patients whom they didn't know whether they were estrogen positive or not. So there wasn't much to do and so a hematology, I really took a hematology fellowship later on called hematology medical oncology. But it was such an early time. What happened there was that all of a sudden around 1976, I think it was right after I finished my fellowship, came the reports of adjuvant chemotherapy, improving disease-free survival for node-positive patients. All of a sudden, these were now healthy women who'd had a mastectomy, most of them, and somebody had to give them the chemotherapy. And uh, my first case was a doctor called me, a surgeon, and he said, is this, who I hadn't really known, he said, is this Dr. Moore? I said, yes. He said, I got a lady here. She uh, just did her surgery. She wants a lady doctor 
<laughs> well, therapy. I said, great, I'll do it. <laughs> that was my first oncology patient. Uh, and uh, she was exactly my age in her 30s. And I gave her the adjuvant chemotherapy, trembling. My hands were trembling when I started doing it. We gave, of course, our own, our own chemotherapy. And uh, she did well and went on to live about 30 years and did die of metastatic breast cancer. So you mixed up your own chemotherapy and gave it yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. There was no, nobody else to do it. There were no, nurse, no nurses who specialized in oncology. So we mixed it up while we sat and talked to the patient. We shook the bottle of chemotherapy on, on the desk and took a syringe, drew it up and put in a little butterfly needle and push the chemotherapy. I hope there are young people listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> no words, no nothing. I mean, the flip side is I think they're overwhelmed with the vast amount that there is to learn now. As you pointed out when you started, it was 5FU. On the other hand, I don't think they realized how difficult it was to be an oncologist in those days. Yeah, yeah. You must have been in one of the first rounds of the boards that B.J. Kennedy pushed through. Uh, the first round of the medical oncology boards, I, I was. I wasn't in the first class, but I was pretty close to it. Yes. And then you sat on the ABIM for a while, correct? I did. I was uh, 10 years for the uh, ABIM on the hematology board. Oh, really? And then I chaired the hematology board. And by the end of the time I was chairing the hematology board, I really was pretty much just doing breast cancer. Well, I was still doing sickle cell disease, thalassemia, breast cancer, lung cancer. And during those 10 years, slowly drifted just into, into breast cancer. I just scraped through as chair of the hematology board. That's fascinating. So I'm going to take you way back now. I, I, tell me about why you were in Peru. Were you born in Peru? When I was two years old, my father worked for W.R. Grayson Company, which was Grace Lines at that time. And they were very active in South America. And he was sent to Lima, Peru. And he went there with four children, came back with five, had a sixth later on. And we just went along, started school there, and then came back to the States. And then I went back right after high school and worked in a medical clinic outside of Lima, in what they call a barriada, which is a poor area where very, very poor people live. I said I would love to work in a clinic. I had been a candy striper. That was my experience. So they let me work there, and literally they would give me syringes. I don't know what was in the syringe, and they taught me to give injections to these patients. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. But and I suspect you did not have malpractice insurance. <laughs> there was no malpractice insurance involved in these situations. But I sure learned a lot, loved it. And have you been back on medical trips or anything to Peru or not to Peru. No, I've never, I haven't been back to Peru since that time. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right. Another question that I've been dying to ask you, I, I'm going to call it an obscure role you've had, which has been the president of the American Clinical and Climatologic Association, yeah. uh, a very interesting group to which I frankly belong, but um, it is the oldest honorific society in America, I believe. Is that true? It was founded in 1884. Yeah. Can you just give, I suspect very few people on this call have ever heard of it. Can you give people, you know, what's the climatologic about? What, you know, what, what's the story on this organization? The American Clinical and Climatologic Society was actually founded in 1884 uh, as a group to study climate. And the reason they were studying climate was they were trying to figure out how to treat tuberculosis. So they figured it had to do with climate. So they'd studied being near hot springs, being near cold springs, being in warm climate, being in dry climate, and gave papers on that subject. It was an all-male group for many, many years. The first women um, were elected around the 1980s. The wives were invited early on to come to the meetings and to sit in on the lectures, but they had to sit in the back rows <laughs> the auditoriums. There was one woman member, and then pretty soon there were two women members. That I came along as in the next wave of, of women for the American Clinical Climatologic. And the group has no longer 
concentrates on tuberculosis. It's, it's a very diverse group with very different medical interests. The vast majority are internists. We meet and listen to papers. The papers are from all different fields, which again, for an oncologist who loves going to ASCO and listening just to the breast cancer talks, it's really exciting to hear the latest in kidney disease, the latest in heart disease. Perhaps one of the medical doctors is interested in the history of medicine will give us a talk. So it's a very, very group different from our usual meetings. And everything is published in the transactions, which is on PubMed. And the papers are absolutely first rate. Yeah, I have to say, I've loved going and listening to things I know nothing about. One talk was on the importance of the oak tree in the history of yes. America. <laughs> right. Because right. we built ships out of oak trees, we, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, and how that then related to medicine. I'll never forget that. Lecture. That's right. That's okay, right. I want to end up with one other, and it's, it's timely. And I understand that when you were a resident, you worked with the now legendary Tony Fauci. How did that happen? Well, Tony was at the National Cancer Institute, the NIH. He had been at Cornell. They invited him back to be chief resident. He came on July 1st, and I was his assistant chief resident, so we shared a very small office. As chief resident and my entire house staff just loved Tony, we would do anything for him. He was smart. He was fair. He was hard, hard working. Working next to him was absolutely a joy. It turns out, which I didn't know at the time, and I wish I had, his father and mother graduated from the New Utrecht High School in Brooklyn in 1928. They had lived in Bensonhurst. Well, my father graduated in that same class and was class president. So I know <laughs> we knew the Pachis, mother and father. And I just wish I had known, because, of course, that generation has gone now. But they all were alive at that time. He's been kind of busy lately. I don't know if you've heard. But maybe when this all boils over, you can have dinner with him and ask him that question. A Brooklyn Brooklyn, uh, reunion. Absolutely. But we loved him as a resident, as you can imagine. So I want to finish with the work you've actually done for ASCO. You are a fellow of ASCO. And I'm sure you're proud of that. You should be. And you've had a lot to do with the self-evaluation program. And I know you've been a mentor for the IDEA program. You were one of the leads of the leadership development program. Uh, And now you're on the board for the Conquer Cancer Foundation. And would you just give a few, this is a little self-serving because I'm one of the foundation's greatest supporters. I the stuff they do is amazing. But tell us a little bit about the Women Who Conquer Cancer that Sandy Swain has started. Women Who Conquer Cancer is a, is a very focused initiative from the Conquer Cancer Foundation, started by Sandy Swain, to try to support with young investigator awards, with career awards, but specifically women. And I think it's so important The ones I think are the most important are the Young Investigator Awards for women who are coming out of their fellowship. Maybe they're married. Maybe they have a baby at home. They've got their hands full. And to have somebody recognize their work and say, we're going to support you, I think is fabulous. I think that's a very hard time for women. They can begin to flounder right at that moment. And there's the Women Who Conquer Cancer Awards to be able to to focus on them. It is their most vulnerable time. And it's actually not a lot of money, but it keeps them alive. And all they got to do is get one paper with their name on it, and we got in their hook, (laughs) in my opinion. I've had two or three now. I've had them, and they're they're wonderful awards. So for those of you who are listening, sit down and write a check to the foundation. That's right. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm shameless. Well, that's about all. We've run out of time now, uh, unless there's any other great anecdotes or anything you'd like to share with us with your career? No, just how important ASCO is and very central to my career. And I hope anybody who's listening appreciates ASCO and the opportunities to serve on many, many, many of the committees and facets of ASCO. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for the, the shout out.
Well, thanks for taking your time to speak with me today. You've been very important to our field in general and to especially women in New York City with breast cancer. Uh, I don't know anybody who doesn't know of and respect Anne Moore if they live in somewhere in the New York City area, let alone the rest of the world. So thanks for your time. I very much appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you in person when this COVID thing goes away. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for doing this series. Until next time, thank you for listening to this JCO's Cancer Stories, The Art of Oncology podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard today, don't forget to give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. While you're there, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. JCO's Cancer Stories, The Art of Oncology podcast is just one of ASCO's many podcasts. You can find all the shows at podcast.asco.org.